Today's uh, webinar is about regional banks. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about Kasikon Bank, which is a Thailand bank, as well as a APEC Financials Dividend Plus ETF, which is a newly listed ETF. I think it was just listed this month or last month. Right? It's really very recent. Um, and I'm Melvin, I'm CEO of Dr. Wealth, uh, but today I am in the capacity of an SJX Academy trainer to share with you some of these opportunities that uh, you might be interested in. Okay, And I assume those who are here today like to invest in bank stocks. Am I right? How many of you actually have bank stocks? Doesn't matter where they are, as long as you have bank stocks, you can just type. Okay, type me. Okay, me is good. <laughs> Okay, I see Yvonne, Angela, Zach. Okay, any more? Uh, I assume you all sure got bank stocks now. You're very interested in bank stocks. <laughs> ah, only three. Okay, I think that there definitely more than that. Uh. Okay, ah, Don also have. Great, thank you. So hopefully today's uh, session will give you a bit more uh, information about banks and especially beyond. Uh, Singapore banks. Uh, I know Singapore banks, the local three banks are favorite among local investors, but uh, there are also opportunities in the region, not just in Singapore. So that is what I'm going to share today. Uh, usual disclaimer, of course, specific investments, uh, stocks, ETFs will be mentioned, but these are not uh, construed as financial advice. Okay, at your day, you are responsible for your own investment decision as well as the outcome. Hey, I'm just here to educate you and give you more information as well as my own views, my own opinion. So this is what we will use at the end of the session. Uh, it's called a pigeon hole. You can either type the URL or there's a link in the chat group. Um, and remember to enter the passcode, which is today's date, right? Sh should be easy to remember. Or you can also scan the QR code and it will link you to the browser, right? So this is my agenda. I have broken down the session into four parts. Okay, first part, I want to give a more overview about banks as an investment. And I believe that bank stocks are good for long-term investment. Although some people may trade it on a short-term basis, but to me, I think majority of the people are more comfortable holding something, right? Because it doesn't, uh, not, not so taxing on your time that you need to look at the markets every day, make sure your timing is right. So most people that I talk to, they invest and hold bank stocks mostly for the dividends. Okay, And second is, uh, as I mentioned just now, I want to broaden your bank investment horizon, not just looking at the local banks, but in the regional as well. And I also talk more about the Lion OCBC Securities APEC Financials Dividend Plus ETF. Yes, it's a very long name. Okay, <laughs> Now it's all very long. Um, and I'll give you some of my opinions, what I think about this ETF, and as well as uh, lastly, Kasikon Bank and this Singapore Depository Receipts, what is it about, right? Because if you want to invest in some of these things, you do need to understand the mechanism so that you gain more confidence, right? Because if you don't understand, then uh, you also don't know where the risks are, right? As well as opportunities. Okay, so let's begin. I think that subconsciously, a lot of investors who buy banks already know this. Okay, but I think it's also good to bring it to the fore so that you are able to uh, rationalize, right? Why uh, investors like to invest in banks. First of all, banks are not the high growth kind of companies anymore, right? We are not in the 19, 1900s, 1920s, you know, those kind of period where uh, banking just came out to become the most important industry, right? Uh, in fact, after discovery of oil banking uh, become even more important okay uh, we is long past the high growth period right whether you're looking at local banks regional banks or even u.s banks generally the banking growth rate is not high it's not like 20 over percent growth rate per year it's not even like 10 over percent growth rate per year per year it's more like a single digit percentage uh, growth per year right still growing but not the fast growth that people are looking at and therefore uh, investors who look for growth companies they usually don't like to buy banks simply because the growth rate is slow but for bank investors what most people like is the stability um, the dividends because banking is a highly profitable kind of business 
right? It, 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 because it earns so much profits, it's able to give high dividends and therefore the yield is very attractive. Okay? And banking is sticky, right? All of us have a bank account. Um, I wouldn't say all, 99.9% uh, .9 maybe. Okay? <laughs> have a bank account and every day we can't go without uh, using banking services, especially now with digital payments you always need these uh, 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 banking services to help you transact, right? So that's why uh, banks are very important in our lives and therefore uh, it's not going to wait. It's not going to go away. They, makes, they, they will make very good stable investments. So the first thing is I want to talk about uh, things that you need to understand is, uh, for example, right? Maybe I ask you a question. If a depositor deposit uh, say $100, right? How much can a bank lend out? Is it less than $100? Maximum $100? Or more than $100? I put this question to you. And Zach say more than, Yvonne say more than, Angela say less than. Okay, the right answer is more than $100. So a uh, banking actually, actually the answer is already here. <laughs> okay, it's on the slides. It's called a fractional reserve banking, which means banks just need to keep a percentage of uh, reserve and they can lend out more than what they actually have in the bank. Okay, so for example, they can, uh, they have $100, they can lend out $1,000. Okay, so inherently a bank creates money. All right, it creates money. Okay, because it's leverage. Banks, all banks are leverage. That is why when you look at their debt to equity ratio, uh, it's like five hundred percent, six hundred percent. It's very normal for a bank. For a normal company, right? Let's say real estate company or retail company, if they are at five hundred, six hundred percent debt to equity, right, they are in trouble already. They can be insolvent very fast. Right? But for banks, they are special. Okay? They are leveraged based on their business model. It is naturally that their gearing is high. Okay. Uh, second is that banks facilitate capital flow, right? As we have discussed, they simply take money from savers and then lend it to borrowers. The interest that they pay the savers are lower and the interest that they charge the borrowers are higher. And therefore, there is this net interest margin, right? So you want this margin to be high, right? Which means you want to pay the depositor as low as possible and you want to charge the borrowers as high as possible. That's how the bank make money. They don't even come out with deposits, right? They don't even come out with the capital. It's other people's money. And they lend, it, lend them your money to other people and they have the, uh, the, the law says they can charge a higher interest for that. So it's pretty amazing, right? Like your own experience, okay? Maybe you deposit in a normal banking account, less than 1% interest a year. But when you want to borrow from a bank, right? let's say you want to buy a house, maybe 3-4% interest rate now, correct? Much more than your deposit interest. If you go and borrow to buy a car, take a car loan, maybe um, 8-9%, right? Unsecured credit, maybe about 15%. And if you take credit card, that is 24%. So you can see how much money the bank can make on money that it doesn't even own. Right? So it's a fantastic business. All right. Third, it supports the economy. Okay? Because lending is important. Um, businesses need funds to expand, to grow, to start new businesses, to go into new projects. And um, consumers like us, right? you need to buy high ticket items. Most people, they don't buy a house or oh, pay cash, right? They will borrow like right, a mortgage loan. If, you, if, the, if the bank doesn't exist, how are you going to own your house? Who is going to lend you the money? Right? So it's important banks play this role to enable uh, business to expand as well as consumers to buy high ticket item. And when they do that, indirectly, they stimulate the economy, right? Because business grow, um, they, they get to sell more things because they buy more things. Uh, business become bigger. Right, so that's how it, uh, banks play a very big role in stimulating the economy. And lastly, I also mentioned transaction just now, right? So it's our everyday affair. Right? Every day we pay for stuff. Uh, money is a medium of exchange. We exchange it for goods and services. 
So we can see that banks are the pillars of capitalism. Without banks, there's no capitalism. As simple as that. Okay. So therefore, banks is likely to be around for a long time to come. Yes, the modality of banks may be different, right? Uh, I think Steve, uh, not Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates did say before, we don't, we need banking, but we don't need banks, something along the lines. Uh, okay, the concept of a uh, bank is like there's a branch, there's physical uh, outlet where you go with a counter staff serving you, whether you want to borrow money, deposit money, exchange money, whatever, right? But given this digital economy, um, banks have transformed. Right nowadays, we have 100% digital banks. They don't even need a, a physical a branch right, to transact. Okay, But at the end of the day, it is still serving banking. Okay? Banking is necessary. Just that the way that banking is done will be different going forward. And you will see even the incumbent banks are also innovating, right, changing, going more digital as such. Okay. So when we come to an analyzing bank stocks, there are a few things that you need to take note of, right? Um, first of all, the revenue source is very simple. It's mostly the interest income because they take money from depositor, they lend it out at higher interest to borrowers. So they take that net interest, right? That's their primary revenue. Of course, there are other things that they charge a fees. Maybe um, you invest some money with their uh, with the bank okay, then the bank will charge you management fees or some sales commission right so uh, or even credit card fees right when you get a bank card the bank actually take a percentage okay from the merchant for example if the merchant is charged three percent visa or master will take some the bank will also take some okay uh, everybody in that network will take some so the fees are also earned in a lot of all these uh, ancillary financial services and for companies, usually they either sell a product or they sell a service. Okay, they cannot earn this kind of interest, right? They cannot, uh, unless they are a finance company, uh, merchant banks, right? Uh, regulated differently, but they still must be regulated if they want to uh, deposit, take deposit and lend out money, right? Because this is a heavily regulated activity. Otherwise, you can produce goods and sell, you can uh, deliver services and earn revenue that way. Okay, as I said just now, that equity for banks for 500% or 600% is normal. For other companies, non banks, it should be below 100% in order to be prudent in terms of the gearing. And for uh, free cash flow, right, this is a measure of uh, the cash flow after capital expenditure is being made. For banks, Due to their business model, their free cash flow is often negative. Right? Okay, it's often ne negative. So if you use free cash flow on banks, it's wrong. Basically, it's just wrong. <laughs> because there's a high level of borrowing and lending activities, their free cash flow end up negative. Right? Then you penalize the bank for nothing. Most banks are negative anyway. Uh, for other companies, having a positive free cash flow is important. Right? Because if it doesn't have positive free cash flow, right? Um, the bank and the bank, the companies, the non-bank companies actually don't uh, deserve to be around actually okay? because they must generate something more than what they consume, right? If their free cash flow is negative, means they consume more than they actually produce or uh, they can sell to the customers or collect money from the customers. Okay? So there is a big difference on this. Um, and then the fourth thing is valuation metric. For example, price to book value uh, is a relevant metric to value banks right? because when it comes to valuation, I always prefer a more uh, a simpler method. I don't like to do those kind of uh, projection with a lot of assumption. Um, is is not that it is tedious. It's more like the assumptions usually is wrong, right? Because you need to predict the future. What is the growth rate? What's the discount rate? Um, all these kind of things. What's the required return? All these are really very iffy assumptions and most people won't get it right anyway so rubbish in rubbish out right so i usually don't like to do modeling in that sense um, i prefer price multiples like this right just give me um, that kind of historical trading range if the price to book ratio for a bank is lower than its previous say five trading years uh, five years of uh, 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 ratios we can make a comparison right so then we know whether it's expensive or cheap right it's as simple as that but for other stocks, you cannot just use like a price to book ratio. 
okay, especially services company, uh, the price to book ratio tends to be high, right? Multiples of it, three times, four times book value is very normal. It doesn't mean that they're overvalued, right? They can still be undervalued. So you will need different ways to analyze them, right? Lastly, banking stocks are uh, banks are heavily regulated, right? They have watchful eyes, okay? If their pay now is down uh, for how many hours uh, they can get fined or some embargo, okay? So these kind of things can happen. Uh, for other companies, there are also regulation, right? Industry specific one, but usually it's less intense. Okay, like banks, they have capital adequacy ratio, they have Basel three framework, uh, those kind of uh, 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 what significantly important banks, all these kind of things. Okay, then they will impose certain regulatory requirements on the banks that they need to fulfill. Right, otherwise they may not be able to operate. All right. So understand, when you analyze bank stocks, they are different. When you pull out their financial statements, they look different from the rest of the companies. Okay, so they are a class of their own. So why invest in bank stock as a long-term investment? Okay, first, steady dividends and attractive views, right? Simply put, okay, you are here today because you like bank stocks, because bank stocks give you good dividends, good dividend yield, steady dividends for a long time to come. So that is the key thing that people are looking at. Um, it also grow in tandem with the economy. As we said, they are the pillars of economy, right? And they lend money to businesses and consumer. Uh, it's a reflection of how well the economy grows. If the economy grows, likely the banks have played a big part in it and the banks will also grow in tandem. So um, uh, therefore, if you know that or you are confident in the country's economic growth, usually the banking sectors will grow together. They are also typically the largest stocks in the country, right? They are the bluest, bluest chips. Uh, the, the biggest company in Singapore are the three local banks. If you look at SDI, Straits Times Index, almost half or even slightly more than half of the index is uh, these three banks. Okay. Uh, if you look across the region, it's the same thing, right? Most of the Asian countries' biggest companies are banks. Right. In China, is that in is that sense it is the same in Malaysia is the same right in Thailand is also the same so these are the uh, stalwarts of the stock market as well and they have high barriers to entry because it's not like you want to open a bank you can just open a bank the authorities need to grant the license right if that you cannot fulfill means you cannot fulfill like even the digital bank there there is a limited licenses there are only four right two that is a uh, full bank uh. Uh, digital full bank and two is the wholesale banks right so there is a limit you cannot just open and say i want to start a bank uh, cannot means cannot heavily regulated right so less funny business okay yeah they, they are being watched all the time and there's also this thing called a big too big to fail now because they are the largest stocks in the company they are the pillars of economy so usually countries uh, the government will not allow the banks to fail and that means that in the worst of times, there will be support uh, to prevent the banks from failing, uh, to prevent bank runs, to restore confidence and things like that. Right? So even in the worst of case, they tend to be more protected than the normal companies. Okay? So you can see there can be a lot of advantages. And now we go to the regional banks, right? So because you'll be happy, right? Oh, the three local banks are doing well. Why should I buy uh, in regional banks in other parts of Asia? So these are something for you to consider. First is that Singapore is a very small population, five plus million people. Yes, Singaporeans are rich, uh, have a lot of wealth to manage, but uh, you just can't compete with larger population because even um, the GDP per capita is not, is not high in Indonesia, but overall GDP is larger than Singapore, right? So when you have a larger population, the number multiplies, okay? And therefore, uh, if you look at the region, you will be able to tap on banks which have exposure to much larger pool of customers and consumers, right? So that uh, and that lengthens the growth runway, right? That also uh, may increase the growth rate for some of these banks, right? That can give you higher returns. And second is that a lot of uh, in each country, right? You will know that there will always be local banks that are the kings. Okay. Usually foreign banks are the smaller players, um, the local banks are the most important banks and the, the authorities will also take care more of the local banks. 
right? Same thing as Singapore, right? The three local banks are more powerful than a uh, lot, uh, have more businesses, uh, right? Have more reach than the foreign banks here. Okay, same thing. When you invest, let's say, um, uh, UOB open a Thai branch, right? And you will see that UOB Thai branch is not as big as the local ones. So anywhere in the region is the same case, right? Yes, local banks can also expand overseas, but they are likely going to be smaller players in overseas. Okay, so if you really want to tap into other regions, uh, populous uh, banking customers, the best way is to buy the local incumbents, right? And the third thing is economic diversification, because if you buy local banks, mainly you're exposed to Singapore economy, right? Nothing wrong with that, stable, good, um uh, uh steady and uh you don't have you get a keen feel of how the economy is doing right but singapore is just one part of a big world right? so it could be a case where other countries may be growing faster and investing in that regional bank will give you that diversification and you get to tap into the faster gdp growth right so that is why uh, it's good to consider regional banks as well and not just stay in the comfort zone of our Singapore local banks. Of course, there are risks when it comes to investing in foreign companies, not just foreign banks, right? Political risk is one. Uh, you cannot assume that the political stability is the same as in Singapore. And of course, if there's any political instability, uh, that can affect how the banks operate, okay? Second is regulatory risk. Different countries will have different regulatory requirements. And uh, although most uh, of the regional banks or even in Asian banks, they follow the Basel Tree framework, right, which is largely the same. Capital adequacy ratio of minimally 10.5%, things like this, right? So um, the, the differences are less already, but that said, there can still be some differences uh, in different regions. Okay? So regulatory risk can also change. And third is currency risk. A lot of the regional banks will trade in their own exchange where in their own currencies. So when you invest in all these overseas investments, you will inevitably be exposed to forex risk as well. Right? So these are the things that you need to understand. And of course, at the end of the day, the benefit must outweigh the risk in order for you to do something. Right? So I do believe that, um, of course, you can be selective. Right? Don't go for uh, banks in countries that are less stable. Uh, more uncertain, right? Or the currency tends to be weaker. Then, in that case, uh, this risk will be higher than if you choose foreign banks that are in more stable regime, right? Reg regulatory uh, standards are quite high, and you know the currency strength is not that weak, right? So, if you flip it around, you should be able to find something that is more palatable, All right? So now let's go on to our. ETF, okay, the first product that we're going to talk about is by Lion OCBC Securities Asia Pacific Financial Dividend Plus ETF. Okay. Um, as the name suggests, it is Asia Pacific, so it's not just Southeast Asia, it includes a big part of Asia, uh, includes uh, Korea. I think they have quite good exposure to Korea, Japan, for example. And financial means it's not just bank, it includes financial groups that may be um, doing other parts of financial services. It can be insurance. It can be uh, securities trading, brokerages, investment banking, right? So there can be a lot more things than just banks. And of course, another keyword here is dividend plus. What does it mean? Okay. So let's break it down, right? When you invest in ETF, the very important thing is that you need to know the index because a lot of ETF are passive. A passive means that they track an index. The fund manager, fund manager doesn't make a decision what to invest, what to sell. The index will inform the fund manager, okay? I did uh, this index, right? I kicked out this stock and I bought, the, uh, I added it to this new stock. So the ETF will have to mirror that action 100%, right? Otherwise, they will tracking error. Okay, so that is how a uh, passive ETF works, right? Active ETF, on the other hand, is different, right? It usually doesn't track index, then the fund manager will need to make the decision. Okay, but most ETFs are passive and they track index. Same thing for this Lion, uh, this Financial Dividend Plus ETF. 
and uh, it tracks this IH APEC Financial Dividend Plus Index. Okay, IH is a indexing service by SGX. Okay, just like you have heard of like S&P, MSCI, FTSE, all these are the big indexing uh, companies. And SGX also came out with their own uh, over the past uh, few years. I think more than that, uh, more than a few years. And IH is their name. Right? So this is the SGX developed index. So let's look, then look at some of the features. So they will buy 30 largest and most tradable APEC financial institution by free float market capitalization. So in other words, how many stocks are there? 30, okay, in Asia, and it is market cap weighted. That means the bigger company will get more uh, uh, weightage, right? Can I? Second is uh, they have a distribution, which means dividends. Okay, they say minimally 5% per annum for the first two years. Then your question is, what happened after the two years? Right? Uh, they did also mention that it's likely to stabilize at 5% as well. Okay? Yeah, so that is uh, uh, typically a very attractive view. Right? So the focus is dividend. That's why the dividend name is there in the, in the index. Okay? And the third thing is that, of course, they also want some capital appreciation. Right, so just like I told you, bank stocks are not high growth stocks, okay? but they still have some growth. Right, they will still grow with the economy. Okay? So you still expect that the bank price, the stock prices will follow the bank fundamentals over the long run. Of course, sometimes due to certain cycles, bank stocks may be down, but the key thing is high uh, in the long term, they should grow in tandem, right, with the economy. Okay, and we can also break down the uh composition right so this is presented by them and 85 percent of the stocks are in our banks so you can see even though they call it a financial dividend plus etf mostly are still banks okay. there's about 10 percent in insurance and then there's another five percent in investment services right but you can just take it as this is essentially a bank etf and in terms of country exposure there's japan South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, Malaysia. Okay. Uh, Malaysia is a small percentage, lah, less than 4%. And the rest are about uh, 16 to 20%. Okay. Quite equally uh, weighted, quite distributed. And mainly these are uh, developed markets, right? Whether it's Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, these are developed markets. We're not looking at uh, developing nations. Right, so which means the stability is there. Okay, of course, in terms of growth, it will likely be lower, right? Because if you want stability, then you won't grow fast. <laughs> if you want them to grow fast, usually you're more volatile. Okay, so they come hand in hand together. And these are the top ten constituents. They take up half of the half of the portfolio, right? So uh, it's weighted more to the uh, bigger banks. And you see the top three are your local banks, which most people will find comfort in, right? There's this uh, KB Financial, this is Korea. Uh, Sumitomo is Japan. Shinhan is Korea. China Construction Bank is China, Hong Kong. This is listed in Hong Kong. This is Japan. This is Korea. And then there's also Australia, correct? Right, so that's how the breakdown is. And I believe majority of these uh, names are what you have heard before and some of you might even have accounts with all right and of course there are some other things that we need to look at okay uh this ticker is lyd a uh, yld very easy to remember right short form for you okay this is the sgd version there's also a usd denominated version called ylu right u for usd so that's how you can remember the ticker um uh, so it depends on you right if you have usd lying around and you don't want to uh convert to sing dollar you can choose the usd version right otherwise i think most people will choose the sgd version if you are based here and if most of your net worth or most of your assets are, are, are denominated in sing dollar likely most people will choose the sgd version the expense ratio is 0.5 percent right of course it's not going to be free okay and to me, I think it's a reasonable expense ratio, right? 0.5% is not high. 
Uh, the best thing is that it gives you the convenience to diversify into this group of stocks, right? Into five different regions, major regions of banking stocks that uh, save you from the headache and oh, which Japan banks I supposed to buy? Which Korean bank am I supposed to invest in? Or which Hong Kong bank should I uh, uh, buy, right? So it gives, it takes away that headache. So you pay the fee, lah. you take away that uh, effort that you need to put in. Right? Just like if you don't want to cook, you go out and eat, you pay a higher price right? for the service that's rendered to you. I think this is only fair. For the first two years, the distribution, as I mentioned, the U is 5% based on the issue price. Okay? And the, the, uh, there'll be a quarterly distribution. So every quarter, they will pay you dividends. Okay? It's not every quarter 5%, uh, right? it's annualized 5%. Okay, so if you divide by four, which means uh, each quarter you get about 1.25%, okay, something like that. Most of the banks give quarterly distribution, right? So that's why I think that's where they can do this on a quarterly basis as well, on every March, June, September, December. And this is also good because that means that if you live on your dividends, right? This uh, having four times distribution a year will help you spread out your in uh, cash flow, right? If they only distribute once a year, then you need to... Uh, plan or budget properly <laughs> how when when and how much to spend on your dividends so this is a good thing uh, frequency does uh, help you uh, help your cash flow a lot better and from third year onwards they also say that it's also likely to be about five percent okay also about five percent you so it's likely to be stable in that sense right uh, some other features is an excluded investment product eip that means um, you don't need to have certain financial background or pass the uh, SIP has all right to be buying this ETF okay and in in SGX the minimum lot size for ETF has dropped to one okay and you can buy as little as one unit and IPO price was one dollar right I think now it's one plus dollars now, okay which means it's very good for uh, money investment plan right Okay, so you can buy uh, minimum chunks and you build up the uh, position over time. I believe there are quite a number of different brokerages as, that offer this money investment plan on this ETF. Right? You can check it out. Uh, I, I don't have the information, right? but you, I think it's not difficult to find out. Um, you see dollar, US dollar versions, and you can also use your SRS. Okay, so you have idle SRS funds. You can also invest in this ETF. Okay, so you can because it's an object, it's easy for you to buy and sell because you're pretty familiar as well. All right. Okay, so this is the uh some other information that you can find. And I always believe that even though you're in for the dividends, right? It is also important to see that the dividend grow over time. Okay, quiz time. If the dividend grow over time, what do you think will happen to the share price? Go up, go down, stay the same. Exercise your fingers a bit. Otherwise, keep listening to me. How? If you see the dividend per share grows over time, what will happen to the share price? Go up, right? Correct. Okay. So that's why I say that there will be some capital appreciation. Okay, because there will be some growth. And it's also true that if you look at a lot of the banks in the region, they have this habit of growing their dividends. And you should be happy about that. Right, because you get best of both worlds, you get good dividends at the same time, your capital also grow in the background, although not the fastest, ah, right? But you get steadiness, all right. And uh, these are just some other information provided by the fund house, okay. That the uh, usually they are very good margin. I told you it's a very good business, right? Okay. Uh, compared to real estate, energy, consumer, a lot of other sectors or industry, you can see financials usually have very good margins, 18% on average. And also Asia Pacific has a lot of untapped market, a lot of more than half of the underbanked adults. So there will be a lot of growth areas coming. Right? In Singapore, I think underbanked adults very few. Lah, right? That's why I say that if you want more growth, uh, considering the regional ones, you might have more opportunities there. All right. So pros, uh, just uh, conclude some of the points or revise some of the points that we have mentioned. Uh, it's a one investment, help you diversify for a reasonable fee. 
right? Attractive U, 5% and it's sustainable uh, with some growth. And the distribution is quarterly. As I said, it's good for cash flow for people who rely on dividends, right? It's an excluded investment product, which means uh, uh, almost everyone who have an account can buy. La. It's not subjected to certain requirements. And you can also use your SRS to buy, okay? There are some cons. If you have some local stocks, buying this ETF may overlap because you can see the top three holdings are also the local stocks. Okay, so you may need to uh, balance it out a bit. Of course, there are some annual fees, right? But as I said, it's reasonable. Uh, it's not CPF approved, so you can use your CPF funds. Okay, hopefully you can. Then in the future, you have one more source of fund that you can tap, uh, that can tap into to invest in this. Okay, next one, we're going to move to Casicon Bank. Right, uh, I put this out uh, from this uh, twin bit. I think it's uh, if I'm not wrong, it's a brokerage, uh, it's an overseas brokerage. So, conveniently, they have uh, tabulated these top five banks in Thailand, right? 20, FY 2023, and the biggest is uh, Kasikon Bank. Okay, so Kasikon Bank is the biggest bank in Thailand based on net revenues. Okay, not based on market cap huh? so because you use different metric the answer may be different right uh, and uh, this is the case so we are looking at the number one player here and these are the some of the metrics that i think are relevant when we want to compare banks okay this will work for local banks as well right because these are some of the things that i prefer to look at um, for banks, I don't think revenue is the most important thing. I think it's the net profit that's most important, right? Because uh, uh, if you are dividend focused, the dividend is paid out from the profits. Okay, it's also how disciplined the banks are to control its expenses, right? If the expenses are tightly controlled, then the, the uh, profits are larger. Okay, uh, in this case, you can see that uh, uh, Casicon Bank is the second largest, right? In terms of net profit, okay, in FY23. In terms of the earnings per share growth, right, you can see it's all single digit. It's not double digit percentage growth. So you don't expect banks to grow very fast, right? So it's reasonable about the GDP growth rate is there, okay, for banks. Um, in terms of net interest margin, Kasikon Bank is the highest, okay? That means they are able to uh, keep the depositors happy by giving as low as possible interest <laughs> or they can end slash all they can lend out at a much higher rate to other uh, borrowers right in terms of ROE uh, very comparable most are single digit some commercial bank have a double digit ROE right slightly better in this aspect uh, non-performing loan you want this as low as possible right that means these are the loans that may turn sour the borrower may not be able to repay. Okay, so it's about two three percent for all. Uh, very close uh, Not much difference. And this capital adequacy ratio, you definitely want to pass the minimum standard. Okay, it's about ten point five percent Basel three uh, requirement. So you can see they definitely clear the minimum requirement by a lot. So they don't gear up so much uh, basically. Right? So they reduce the chance of a bank run. Okay. And uh, also very comparable, uh, 19 20% is about there. But too high capital adequacy is ratio is also not good, right? Because if it's too high or if it's higher than uh, relative to other competitors, means that they keep too much in the bank, right? They don't have much business, too much capital in the bank. So they should uh, lend out more, but still above the requirements. Right, so that is the uh, sense sensing. But overall, you can see that the banks in Thailand, the major banks in Thailand, they are more or less the same in terms of their operating metrics, and it's also very similar for local banks. Right, the three local banks. If you compare the metrics, are also very close together. It, it, it's hard to tell one from another. Right, so that is uh, uh, it's not a bad thing. Generally, that means that the banks are well are, are pretty much. Uh, stable in terms of the competition okay, it's not one is better than the other and likely the market share is going to be stable as well right so that also means that your dividends from the banks are going to be stable okay it's a good thing rather than that thing and uh, same thing as with just now what we saw asia pack banks in general grow their dividend and Casicon bank is also one that has grown their dividends and you can see this is a 13 year track record okay most of the time, you can see that the dividend grow, and this was COVID. 
so special case lah. It cut dividend, but after COVID, it started to grow again. And in 2023, record high dividend, 6.5 baht. Yeah, I think this is baht. Um, higher than pre-COVID numbers really. Okay, so it has already fully recovered or even surpassed its uh, pre-COVID profitability. Okay, so this is a good sign. And the yield is also above five percent. Okay, uh, but this this was taken, I think two weeks ago, right? So the the price will change. The yield may be different. So please check before you do anything, right? So you can see that this is uh, uh again the profile. If you compare to the local three banks, they are similar, right? They have this growth trajectory. They are able to grow their dividends uh, over a long period of time. And also, I think because of the high interest rate environment it benefited the banks a lot okay now i want to flip it the other way for before the Federal reserve have raised interest rate in the past two years right prior to that 10 years or after 2008 financial crisis interest rate has been low okay and when interest rate is low it's harder for the bank to make money because they can't lend out at a higher rate right their net interest margin is very compressed okay? yet they can still grow their dps like that Okay. And if we take a look now, the interest rate is high at, uh, in US is about 5, 5, 5.25 to 5.5%, right? It's high. Okay. And banks are enjoying it, right? Because now they can raise the interest, uh, charge on a lot of things, right? Of course, your deposit interest, they wouldn't increase a lot. Okay. That's always the case. It's their chance to uh, widen the net interest margin and they will do it. And that's why the profits went up, the dividends record. Okay. Now the next question to you, right, is that do you think when interest rate get cut, right, because a lot of people expect interest rate get cut, I also think that it will get cut, okay, do you think in the next few years, interest rates will go back to what it was before the Fed raised the interest rate? That means close to 0%. Do you think we can go back to close to 0% interest rate for the next 10 years? Yes or no? You can type that chip. What do you think? Do you think interest rate will go back to near 0%? Is that say no? Of course, we won't know for sure, lah, but it's just a good guess. Okay. So the sensing is, which I, also be, which I also have the same opinion, is that it's unlikely. Lah. Okay. It's unlikely we'll go back to the near 0%, uh, especially with a lot of all these trade wars going. Correct or not? Because the trade wars will increase uh, trade friction. You'll make everything more expensive which means the inflation will be a lot more stubborn, right? Will be a lot more stubborn. And if interest rate get cut, but not as low as what it is before, which means the banks actually have a lot of breathing space. If they can survive near zero interest rate, right? For so long, 2% interest rate or 3% interest rate, right? They are more than happy, okay? Which means their business results is expected to be continue to be good, even if interest rate get cut, right? Maybe just not as good as past two years, lah. When interest rate is a lot higher. Okay, but definitely, they should not have a problem surviving because they have done it for near 0% for more than 10 years. <laughs> no problem right, for a lot of these banks. Okay, so that is generally the, the views that I have. And we can also compare Casigon bank multiples, right? As I said, I always like to compare the historical five year average, right? Um, I always prefer to buy if it's at uh, minus one standard deviation or plus one standard de deviation for the use. Right, so we can take a reference. So the price book ratio currently is at zero point six times. Uh, fire average is 0 0.7 times. Right, so it's un it's not reasonable to say that oh I will wait until uh, let's say you want to sell the stock right. Uh, I'll wait until it go to price to book one then I sell right because historically it doesn't go to one. Okay, you have to have a very special occasion in order for you to be able to sell at one times book value. So the average is about 0.7 and the minus one standard division is 0.5, right? So now it's not, it's slightly between, it's between, okay? It's not the best price, but it's not the expensive price. Okay? It's below the fire average. And in terms of PE is at 6.7 uh, times, average is 8.7 times. So it's lower, which is good, right? Lower means cheaper, okay? And the minus one standard division is 7.2. So it's also lower. Right, so from a uh, earnings perspective, actually Kansigong Bank is considered cheap. Okay, and likely because of the net the interest 
uh, has been high. So they've been earning more money than normal. And that's why you see it was a record high dividend they gave out last year. So dividend yield is 5.1%, also higher. So you, you want to be plus one standard deviation, right? So it's also higher than the 4.8%. So overall, we can see that actually casino Bank stock, uh, what the conclusion we can get is that it's not expensive. Okay, even at current levels, it's not expensive, right? So another advantage is that uh, if you find the local banks are expensive in terms of valuation, another way is you look at the region. Some of them, like Kasikon Bank, may not be as overvalued. And then it can present an opportunity to you, right? The next thing is, uh, this Kasikon Bank, right, is listed in Thailand. Okay, but you don't need to buy in Thailand because there is a Kasigon Bank SDR, Singapore Depository Receipt, that is uh, traded on SGX. And it is in Sing Dollar. So you can buy Kasigon Bank in Sing Dollar and collect dividends in Sing Dollar. Okay? All right? So that's the beauty of it. Which means now SGX, via this SDR mechanism, is able to allow you to buy foreign stocks, selected uh, selected foreign stocks in SGX ecosystem. You use the same broker, the bid ask spread, the, the uh, price intervals, the trading hours, everything is as per normal, right? So that is a big advantage, okay? And you stay in your own familiar ecosystem without the need to uh, have an account with overseas, right? Because not all brokers have Thailand or Thai stock exchange connections, right? So having this will help you access uh, foreign securities a lot easier, right? This SDR, okay? And uh, maybe let me explain the SDR first, huh? Before I talk about the additional information. Because you need to know how it works. Huh? So this Singapore Depository Receipt is like uh, ADRs. Some of you may have bought ADRs listed in the US, American Depository Receipts. Maybe the concept is similar. It allows people to buy uh, foreign listed securities on, as, uh, on US exchanges. Okay. So SDR is a mirror of the ADRs, just that the SDR, is, they are traded in Singapore in, on SGX. Okay. So how it works is that um, you don't worry, it's not like a... Uh, like a just a empty contract it's not uh, it does have the underlying shares that is securitized okay so for example this sdr will have an overseas custodian right the overseas custodian will actually hold the actual stocks or actual shares in thailand in this case okay so let's take Kasikon bank as an example so this overseas custodian will hold Kasikon bank shares okay and then the SDR issuer will base on this custody to issue the equivalent number of SDRs that is traded on SGX. Okay, so they are backed by actual stocks. Yeah. And which means if you want to convert at one point, let's say you buy the SDR and say, okay, I want the actual stocks, you can actually pay a admin fee and convert the SDRs into the actual stocks. The broker or the issuer will deliver it to you. Okay, so in other words, you are actually still buying the actual shares. Okay, just that you are trading the SDRs. Okay, uh, but they are backed by actual shares. You can have then the SDR issue also handle corporate uh, corporate action. What does what that means is that if the Kasikon Bank in Thailand distribute the dividend the SDR issuer will pass the dividend to you. They will convert the Thai baht into Sing dollars. If let's say there are some other corporate actions like um, uh, rights issue, bonus issue, you will be entitled the same as per a normal uh, Kasikon Bank shareholder. So you don't need to worry that, you know, what happens, you know, this, this and that, do I get the benefit, right? You will get everything. The only thing you can't do is to vote in the AGM, right? Anyway, I don't think you want to fly over to vote in AGM, okay? Go there for shopping, okay? Go there to vote for AGM, I think it's a bit overkill, right? Uh, 
so that is the only thing that you can't do. But majority of the corporate actions you are able to you will be able to benefit. Okay. And on the SGX, that's where the trading of the SDRs are happening, right? They are also market makers. Okay, so what are these market makers? The market makers will provide the liquidity, which means these market makers will buy and sell with you. Okay, on top of other investors buying and selling with you, right? If there is not enough liquidity, the other ones, because they hold inventories, they actually hold these SDRs and they will trade with you. Right? So you don't need to wait for a counterparty to come in. Like there's always a ready buyer, ready seller. Of course, they have a spread. Nah. So they are like, think of them like money changer. Okay, you want to buy pounds, uh, you use sing dollar, buy pounds, then maybe somebody is trying to sell pounds, buy sing dollar. So they are this uh, intermediary, right? They are the money exchanger in the stock market, right? They're called market makers. And they're important, okay? Because the SDR are priced in sing dollar, they will take reference from the Thai bar. Okay. They will take reference from the actual trading, then they will price it accordingly. So these market makers also help you price the SDR. Right? The good thing is there's only there's more than one market maker, which means among these money changers, right? like for example, you go to I don't know arcade or what, there's a lot of money changer, right? The rates are more competitive. Because if they are rates are the the rates sucks, right? Nobody's gonna exchange money with them. So same thing if the bid ask spread is not tight enough. Um, uh, other people will, other market makers will get the deal, get get the tricks. Then they got nothing, right? So they will always try to price the bid ask spread as competitive as possible. So you do want to have more than one market makers. And the good news is SDRs have more than one market makers, so it's competitive. So your bid ask spread will be narrower. Okay, so they are important because they set the price for the local market, uh, the SDRs. And you can use your normal bro brokers. You don't need a special brokers. You can buy sell this SDR as per normal. The commission is the same. And I think for some brokers, they even have a discount for people who trade SDRs now. And if your uh if your SGX securities are customized in CDP, same thing, the SDR will also be customized in CDP. So when you receive a CDP statement, you also will see your SDRs there. Right? So you can see it's very convenient. Um, the way that operate is the same. The way you buy and sell is the same, and the way you monitor or track your position is the same. And if your securities are customized by your broker, then your SDR will also be customized by your broker. Okay, so this is how it works, All right? So uh, some benefits: access to global securities, as we mentioned, you can now buy uh, some of these SDRs or overseas stocks in SGX. Okay. I think there are more than 10 now, right? Uh, all in Thailand, okay, currently. But I believe they will expand to other countries eventually. Uh, it trades in Sing dollar, so you don't need to convert. And you can actually uh uh want the actual Thai shares, you can request for it to be converted as well. Just need to pay a fee. And it's transparent because you can access the same public information. Right? Okay, let me ask you. Do you think Kasikon Bank annual report is in Thai or is in English? What do you think? They are listed, primarily listed in Thailand, huh? Okay. What do you think? Is Kasikon Bank annual report in English or in Thai? And just say English, Kim say Thai. <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> okay. Thai and English. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Actually, the clue was here. Sorry, sorry. Actually, this is English or Thai? This is English, right? This slide, right? This is a slide from them. I didn't build this. Huh? I just print screen from their slide and I post it here. Okay. And all my research done, I have no problems with all these Thai SDR because they always have an English version. Even their presentation is English. I sat through some of their IRs. I think uh, CPR. Wow, the uh, standard of disclosure and presentation is really quite impressive. Yeah, and they, they speak in English. Okay, the whole uh, uh, briefing was in English. Okay, so they do deliver that, and you can find information, right? Um, you can. So the Casicom Bank have their own investor relation website. You can get their updates there. You can also go to SGX. You type Classicom Bank, the latest announcement will also appear here, right? When they distribute dividend, for example. 
And you can also go to the Thai uh, website, Thai Exchange website to get the Classicon news as well. So uh, they're all in English, right? So it's not a problem um, uh, investing in some of these securities, right? And I also believe that why SGS chose them is due to uh, the language that's easy to understand. Uh, they are mainly in English as well, okay? So of course, there are some risks that you need to understand. Huh? Again, overseas stocks, they will have political, regulatory, economic uh, factors that you need to be wary about to may change. Uh, forex risk will still exist. Even though you trade in Sing dollar, remember the market maker will still need to convert the Thai baht equivalent to Sing dollar. Right? So there will still be some forex risk. Okay. Right? But um, usually the is competitive, as I said. Right, they will not add in the spread so much. Okay? Unless, unless uh Singapore market is open, but Thailand market is closed. Right? So whenever the Thai market is closed, right, the reference for Kasikon Bank or other SDR is not available. So in order for them to protect themselves, right, they will tend to widen the spread. Okay, yeah. On cases where Singapore market is open, SDR are still trading, huh? But the underlying stock in Thailand is not trading. And then you may have a spread that's wider. So in that case, then you don't buy during this period. Huh? <laughs> okay. You buy when both are trading. Then usually the, the spreads are more competitive. So pricing risk, as I mentioned, right, they may deviate. Okay? Especially when Thai exchange is closed. Singapore is open. Uh, you have no voting rights. You cannot vote in AGMs. Okay. Yeah, we have come to the last slide. So in summary, bank stocks, as we discussed, are very good long-term in, uh, investments, especially for those who want dividends because the yields are good and you get some capital gain over time. It's not the uh, highest capital gain you can get, but it's a steady growing one. Second is instead of just looking at local banks, consider regional banks because um, the growth areas are likely coming from other areas uh, rather than in Singapore. Uh, but that's it, Singapore also will have some growth, huh? not totally zero. And also that if the local banks are overvalued, if you find, you may be able to find some other value banks with uh, equal characteristics, equal fundamentals, growing dividends, um, have went through the baptism of fire during the Asian financial crisis, 2008 financial crisis, as well as COVID, right? A lot of all these banks have weathered those crises. Uh, they become stronger. And third is you can use the ETF if you don't want to like crack your brain, uh, which overseas bank I want to buy. Or you can just buy the whole ETF, you get a 5% yield, uh, pay a, f that's, that's after fee, right? So you get 5% uh, uh, yield, that's quite reasonable, right? Quite, quite attractive actually. And we also went through Classicon Bank, uh, which is a first foreign bank that is traded as an SDR in Singapore. Right? And it's fundamentally strong, have that kind of growth trajectory as well, reasonably big price. Right, so that is the end of my presentation. We can go to the Q&A, right? but before that, uh, these are some uh, additional resources that you can get, it's free. Uh, you can either join the SGX Telegram, you can scan the QR code, it will link you there, or you can, if you prefer email, newsletter, or uh, both, that's the best, right? You can scan both and you can get updates from SGX, right? So because uh, periodically they will give you some research ideas, they will give you some uh, uh, data and statistics for you to make some investment decision. Okay, all these are free, right? No harm.